I'm at the last stage of putting in the new raspberry trellis. This is a summer fruiting raspberry trellis. We came up with a unique design and this is going to help us to train summer fruiting raspberry canes outwards, the mature canes, and allow new ones to come up through the middle. Summer fruiting raspberries, so flora canes, and I went through this in my previous video, these are raspberries that produce berries on second year wood. So they grow the first year, they don't do much, and then they come into their own in the second year. And that's why you have to pay attention to the canes and not chop them all down at the end of the year. Unlike autumn fruiting raspberries that produce berries on their first year canes, you don't have to worry about keeping track of the old wood and new wood because you just lop them all off and then they produce berries on whatever canes they grow in that year. And that's why the trellis is different. The H-frame trellis that the autumn fruiting raspberries are on, they really just give support because it is quite windy here. So it helps to keep the canes from flopping over and breaking. And they have done in the past before I put that uh, trellis in at the allotment some years ago now. Now this one is different. So again, the summer fruiting raspberry canes, they'll grow in their first year. They'll come up here to these lines I'll tie them in at the end of the season, and then they'll overwinter tied to these lines. It'll give them extra support. And then the next year, they will start blossoming and fruiting. And at the same time, new canes will start growing up through the middle. And these lower wires will help to keep them kind of tucked into the center. And also, because we're pulling the canes out to the side here, those new canes have room to grow up through the middle. That's the idea anyway. We'll see how it goes over the coming year. And also we'll have a look again at the raspberry structure for autumn fruiting raspberry so that you can see the difference. Now today I'm going to finish up building this. I'm gonna show you how we built it. And then I'm gonna show you also around the garden progress that we've made and also have a little discussion about the allotment because that's right, as of now, I no longer have an allotment and I'll talk about my last day at the site and also plans moving forward. Are, so each of the long lengths is 1.5 meters. The little pieces in between are there for support really and they're going to be where I attach eyelet screws and connect wires. The space down here or actually it's up here where it hits the ground so after we dig it in it will be about eight inches apart and then up here the distance here to here is 28 inches and Josh cut all of these pieces here in the center at an angle they're 10 degrees and they fit together perfectly do you think it's level Oh yeah, it's right there in the center. We've got the five supports buried in the soil now, good depth. And now Josh is just looking at building stabilizers for the end pieces. And that's just to stop them from bowing in. And what were you thinking, Josh? Like how many, like the size of them and how deep? Probably about 80 centimetres long. About 80 centimetres long. Maybe a bit less. What we've done now is Josh dug a hole there and then we kind of looked to see how deep this prop could go in. And so we're going to screw it in just below that horizontal brace there and then backfill. I've finished stringing line from each one of these frames 
So let's have a look and see how this is all put together. Now, each of the frames, they are leveled. So we used to level to make sure that it's perfectly straight, even though we're on a slope. And they're about six feet from the next. And they're held together through wire. Now, normally I would use a, a little bit thicker gauge wire, but I had this free. I found it at the house when we moved in, so I'm using this and we'll see how it goes. And I've just screwed in some eyelet screws, put the wire through, twisted it, and done. And there is line here at the top. So you can see just here at the top, there and there. And then down below, there are two more lines of wire. In contrast to the new supports over here on the left, I also have my H-frame supports from the allotment now installed here on the autumn fruiting raspberry bed. Josh put these in for me. They're spaced about the same distance as the other frames, but you can see that they're just open at the top. Just a, a nice open space with wire that is actually going down the middle the sides, across, and even here in the middle. And that's because I'm not tying any of the raspberry canes into the wires here. The wires and the H-frames, they just give a little bit of support to these autumn fruiting raspberries. And some people don't even use supports when they're growing them, but it's quite important for my garden because we do get quite a bit of wind summer storms and I don't want my raspberry canes getting knocked over like they have in the past. What are you doing there? You can hop up on the roof. <laughs> Boy. <laughs> Maggie is directly above me on the shed roof and she's just hanging out up there. So we're here obviously in the home garden and starting this year all of the videos and everything that I show you is going to be in the home garden and that's because on the last day of January not too long ago I gave up my allotment plot and I've had a plot at the Laxey allotment for 13 years and for most of that time I was also the association secretary so I helped to run the site and if you're not sure what an allotment is I made a video you can go check that out and learn a bit more about allotments and growing vegetables on plots like that throughout Britain and in other places in the world. I met the new tenants of the plot, my plot that I gave up, and they were absolutely thrilled to be taking it on. They're big wildlife people, they're involved in the local bat group, so they love bats, they love all different types of wildlife, and so having the pond there was a great asset, and also a lot of the plants that I had to leave at my allotment, they're going to take on. So the lavender will be loved and won't be dug up. And I think a lot of the other plants. So that makes me really happy. I do feel a little bit of sadness still about that plot, but mainly I feel relief that I now can focus 100% on the home garden. It's gonna get all of my time, all of my effort, all of my thought, and I won't be have that feeling of being pulled between two gardens. And the thing is, is that when you have too much on your plate and you're not able to give the attention that one thing really needs, it suffers, the other things in your life suffer as well. And that's what really happened with my allotment. Having so much more outdoor space here at home means that I can work here, I can have my garden here, and I can pass my allotment plot on to someone who will love it more than I will actually at this point. And so that's what's happened. I'm no longer a plot holder at the Laxey allotment, but I think it's actually a good thing and it will give me the time and the space to make some really fun improvements here in the home garden this year to grow even more food, even more plants, and to take you along on the journey with me as well.
the discovery apple tree that we planted not too long ago seems to be doing just fine as are all the other trees and shrubs in the garden now the plan for january and february has been garden expansion work and that is well and truly on its way with the raspberries planted here and on the other side and this central large bed is pretty much complete as far as putting all the compost on top you'll notice that there's two different colors of compost now the light brown stuff that is pure composted horse manure and the dark stuff is the better quality stuff that I get from a local producer of compost and this is mixture of manure and also wood chip and other green waste that they make into compost so that's what that dark strip is along the side of the drive here I've planted three of the thornless blackberry bushes you can see one there and then the other two are further up mulch with compost and in between them I have planted some comfrey and I will get to tackling the grass in a no-dig fashion fairly soon as well as putting in a new blackberry trellis that is on the to-do list now beyond this area here so this grassy bit here this is going to be a new bed as well and with that that will be the vegetable patch that will be the final size of it whereas all the area down here will be orchard for the bees and where that wood chip is that is where i hope to put one of two ponds this year as well if you look really closely you'll see bees coming out of the entrance of primrose here and i've seen plenty of bees coming out of both colonies and so i feel reassured that they're doing great and fairly soon i'll be able to open up the colonies and have the first inspection take some of those extra supers off and get them ready for spring the edible hedgerow that's along here that we planted up as bare root shrubs last winter you can see they're starting to come back to life as well i don't want it to encroach too much on this bed here in particular and so i have been pruning some of the branches back including one of the main stems of this elder there are plenty of other stems coming off here here and here but this one was really leaning out kind of into this space and so i cut it back but instead of putting that branch through the chipper and putting it into the compost what i did was i cut it into segments and then i pushed those segments here into the end of this bed and i made sure that the buds were facing up and have a look they have all rooted every single one of them it's as easy as that to propagate new plants from cuttings especially shrubby plants like elder and currants and gooseberry which i'll get to in one second Ooh, i've not spotted this before i transplanted the rhubarb over here both plants and look at it it's already up this one is the let's have a look at the label this is the Polish raspberry. What I wanted to show you though was these sticks here kind of pushed in against the wood at the back of this bed. And just like the elder, these are cuttings that I've taken off of other shrubs. The more prickly plants like this, these are gooseberry. And I didn't take any of the gooseberry plants like the actual bushes from the allotment, but I did take some cuttings. And I also took red currant cuttings which are these ones here and there are plenty of them and they root really easily so in the same way as those elder cuttings do and this way i was able to take cuttings and propagate quite a few new plants that i'll then again transplant and move around the garden once they've established a good root system before we go inside the polycrub, I want to talk about this space outdoors here, right in front of it. I've not really been sure what to do with it until recently. I had a really good think. I shared some ideas on my Instagram stories, but let me tell you what I'm thinking right now. 
We had to do quite a bit of work back here to replace an old land drain. You can see just the faint outline of it there. And the soil here is really compacted. It's clay with a lot of hard core, so rubble in the soil. It can be as hard as stone when it's dry. So what I'm thinking is to create a nice pathway here from the, the brick patio area to the door of the polycrub. I would like to amend the soil so that I can plant lavender along this side and have it kind of soften up the edge of the concrete or breeze blocks that are here along the side of uh, the pathway here. Same goes for along the edge of the brick patio. I'd love to see some lavender along here, but I'm going to have to have a look at the uh, soil. And then raised beds. But instead of the wooden raised beds that I have inside the polycrub, I'm going to get some metal raised beds to put here and grow a herb garden. This little corner outside the polycrub is really pleasant. It gets a lot of late afternoon sun which is why we have the bench there. But this area here, which we had covered a bit last year, it's kind of wasted space that I haven't really been thinking could be used for much. But I had the thought of maybe putting in another small pond. I wanna put one further on down inside the garden, so at the foot of the garden, but here it's nice and flat. It'd be so nice to sit there in the summer with a small view of a small pond just here and plants growing around the edges. Let me know what you think about the idea. Let's have a look inside the polycrub. I've been bringing you in here from time to time over the winter. And it's been interesting for me to watch as well because it has stayed nice and warm and protected in here throughout the winter. And we've been growing lettuces and other greens in here those spring cabbages that are outside, I planted some in here as well. They are far more advanced than those ones outside. Look at how lush they look. And the greens are starting to grow again. Some of them are even starting to bolt. And so we need to harvest the entire plant now instead of just taking some of the leaves. And you can see we've already made a start on some of these pak choy or Asian green vegetables. And also down here, lettuces are starting to grow. It's just been such a great thing being able to have this all winter long and to rely on our own fresh greens. If we wanted to come out here and, and get some perpetual spinach or some mustard or lettuce, it's just been here ready and waiting. As far as the temperatures, I reset this yesterday and you can see that Overnight, the coldest it got was 8.8 .8 Celsius, and the warmest it's been today is 21.4. This is proper late spring temperatures. Let me, let me see if I can put this into Fahrenheit so you can see the difference. So it's been no colder than 47.8 degrees Fahrenheit. That is really good, and that makes me think that maybe I should start sowing some more things early. Now, I tend to wait for most seeds or most of the early seeds until Valentine's Day, but if it's gonna be warm and cozy in here, why not experiment and see if some early veg will start to germinate? Look who's decided to join us. She knows, it's Maggie time. Come on, Mags, show us around. <laughs> ah. Now I know why Maggie's in here. Maggie, what's this? What's this? What's this? Oh, what's this? This is catnip. And because I have it here in the polycrub, <laughs> we've got some fresh leaves. Oh, Maggie, is that nice? Is that nice? <laughs> Ow, careful. Oh gosh, it was really pungent. Really pungent. <laughs> I was at the tip about two months ago, roundabout, and I've, I've got to go to the tip to drop off our recycling. We don't have recycling curbside pickup out here. And there's a little free section where you can drop off items and have a little look to see if you could use any of the items there. And I found this. It is a pet 
poo wormery. And I am really curious to try it out. This idea of composting pet waste is one that I've been thinking about for a while because we've got three cats. Two of them prefer using a litter tray and they do use the wood pellets as uh, their litter. So I can compost that and then I could take, I suppose the, the fecal matter and perhaps use a wormery to compost that. So that was a really good find and I probably wouldn't have explored it at this point if I was gonna buy it new, but now that I have it, why not give it a go? I moved my actual kitchen waste wormery into the polycrub as well. And the worms have been active and I have been putting in some food for them. And I just saw a bunch of them kind of slink away. You can see them there in the center. I'll lift up this banana peel. And there's um, potato peels in here as well. Some things trying to even grow. <laughs> And uh, this is one of the ways that I use to compost food waste. I don't throw any food waste away. Everything gets reused here for the garden. And this is a really great tool for composting food waste from the kitchen. So things that might attract vermin out in the compost pile can either bokashi ferment it and then put it out into the compost or I can put it out here for the worms. I'm going to go inside after this and have a look through my seed library and see if there's anything that really takes my fancy as far as greens, like maybe perhaps some baby salad leaves or some kind of mix like that to sew up in the polycrub because it is so warm. Just kind of experiment and get a first new crop of the year going. But one thing that I am going to be sewing right now for sure is my aubergines. I'm planning on growing four varieties of eggplant or aubergine in the polycrub this year. And they include Mitoyo, which I got from Baker's Creek. And I grew that one last year. There was just one plant last year. Most of the aubergines that I grew last year were Moneymaker. And I had a few people ask me, are you sure that they're called Moneymaker? Yes, there's a tomato called Moneymaker and also an aubergine slash eggplant and they grew really, really well. That's an F1 variety, whereas Mitoyo is a heritage open pollinated variety, I believe. Another F1 that I'm trying this year, just out of curiosity, is this really long variety called Violet Nights. And apparently this one is a little bit of a climber as well. But over time, I do want to gravitate more towards open pollinated varieties which is why I chose this striped variety. And this one is called this. I, I'm not even gonna try to pronounce it. That's the variety. And this was one of the few large types of aubergine or eggplant that I could find locally that was open pollinated and also striped because I just fancy growing a striped variety. I saw some in the supermarket recently and they just look amazing, so. Very excited to see what happens with these ones. Even though these look like traditional peat pots, these are not, these are peat free and they're made out of cocoa core. And I started using these last year and they work really well for starting off seeds. I don't use any peat in the garden and you'll often hear me refer to peat free potting mix or peat free this or that because I'm an organic gardener. And as an organic gardener, I don't use peat because it's environmentally destructive. Peat should remain in peat wetlands. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is I'm going to take a couple of seeds. So we'll start with this Matoyo and just wiggle them into the surface of the core pots. And you can see that the seeds are pretty small. And I'm trying to stretch out these Matoyos because I did order them from the States. And sometimes seeds, when you order them from the States here, they go walkabouts in the post or they never arrive. So I'm glad that I have these. Maybe the next time I go to the States, I'm gonna send some of these to my mom's house or to one of my good friend's house and um, 
take a bunch of seeds back home with me. Okay, so I've got the seeds here just at the surface. I'm just going to get them underneath the surface. They don't need to go very far underneath. And the rule with sowing seeds is that they really shouldn't be under the surface any more than two to three times the actual size or the length of the seed itself. They're all potted up now and when I was going through the seeds I found that there was only one lonely moneymaker seed in the packet so there's just one seed in here. Hopefully it germinates because it was a good variety but again because I want to start saving seeds in the future I probably won't buy this variety again because it is an F1 hybrid which means that if I try to save seeds in the future that they won't grow true they'll just be an unpredictable type of fruit and it might not be very tasty and it'll change from time to time that I grow it so it's, there's no point in trying to grow F1 hybrids or from self-saved seed but a couple of those are actually heritage varieties, open pollinated varieties, and so I can save seed from those potentially. Now these are going to go in the house on heat and they'll be living in the house under grow lights and on heat and in a sunny place for a good while until I eventually plant them out into the polycrub again. And I cannot wait for even more harvest this summer. It starts now with these plants that need a long time to grow and mature. I've been working on and off over the last few months on a natural soap making course. And I do have some soap making videos here on the channel. Aside from being an organic gardener, I am a soap maker as well. And it's one of the reasons that I've gone down to just uh, a video every other week for the time being. But that's all recorded. I'm going to be spending this coming week editing. And so hopefully that will be out pretty soon. And if you want to learn a bit more and find out when it is available, or just because you like gardening content that arrives in your email inbox for free, please sign up to the Lovely Greens newsletter and I'll leave a link down in the video description. It should be right at the top and then that way you'll get an email from me every couple of weeks with all of the latest videos and uh, content on the website and ideas for your garden and for soap making that you can use then and there. Now there are plenty of things coming up in the garden. We discussed some of them when we had our little walk around. There's going to be seed sowing season next month. May or March is just absolute madness and chaos and seeds flying up in the air as I and a lot of people start sowing seeds and preparing for the year ahead. But these kind of last weeks of winter are great for putting in raspberry supports, for putting in wood chip pads and for doing other projects and I just want to point out I'm sitting here next to my pallet potting bench right here it served me well and if you don't have a place yet to sow seeds and to work either indoors or outdoors I highly recommend that you make one of these it's really easy and all you need is a couple of wood pallets you can go over and watch that video next to see how you can make these thanks so much for watching and I will see you next time here on Lovely Greens. Bye for now.